Welcome to Circuit Talk, Funders and Founders. I'm John Cole, Senior Manager on the Semiconductor Team at MITRE Ingenuity. We are a nonprofit dedicated to solving problems for a safer world. Our semiconductor team is hard at work meeting the nation's challenges around semiconductor breakthrough technologies and the CHIPS Act. Circuit Talk, Funders and Founders, is part of MITRE's Circuit Talk podcast and video series, and it elevates the revolutionary, disruptive work being done by semiconductor entrepreneurs and investors. This is an exciting time to be working with semiconductor startups. The nation is waking up to just how critical they are to our national and economic security. I'm joined today on Circuit Talk Funders and Founders by Mohammed Qasim, founder and CTO of eFabulous. Mohammed founded eFabulous in 2014 with the goal of creating a world where 14 year olds can design a chip. Mohammed studied electronics and communication engineering at Ein Shams University, and then earned an MS in electrical engineering at the University of Waterloo. He started his career at Mentor Graphics and developed analog and mixed signal chips there, and then later moved on to TI, where he led a team designing mixed signal chips. Mom's work at eFabulous has covered everything from open source design, fab operations, and software development, just like a great entrepreneur should. So welcome, Mohammed. Thank you very much, John. Uh Thanks for the opportunity to have me here. So. It was great to have you here. Thanks for coming on. Um, you've had quite a journey before starting eFabless. What did you do before you started eFabless? What was that journey like? And how did it lead you to, to founding eFabless and solving the problems you solved there? So on the on the journey in general, you plan something and some other things happen. And that's so that's the, the standard story. So um, I was... Uh, I grew, you know, I grew up in Egypt, and once I graduated, uh, I was one of the first people uh, to start the office of Mentor Graphics in Cairo. And uh, literally, I went, I traveled to get the CDs and install them in Egypt and work with customers there. Um, so I, but primarily, I was doing uh, technology transfer and team building. So I would go to the U.S. and travel back to Egypt and build a team. Until uh, for five years, and then I switched. I wanted to go to actual uh, design company, you know, chip design company, and and I went to University of Waterloo. And through that, I uh, got an internship at TI. And uh, and at TI back then, people don't know that it's not like something known. But at TI in the year two thousand, the Nokia phones that are all over the world were chip. The chips were made with TI, and. Huh. And so most people talk about the calculator, but mm-hmm. uh, but the, 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 basically TI started the digital t- phone revolution in terms of chip development and delivery. So I was uh, time and place and all the stars aligned. I got into into the group, the wireless group, which uh, in, in, interestingly enough, it was not just a design group. We were the driver team that takes the any new technology in the semiconductor space uh, that is. TI d- developed and build chips on it. And mm-hmm. so we work closely with the process developers and the technology, uh, you know, teams to come up with a better design. And that experience was, uh, you know, for me, it was incredibly useful. And it is, it made my career to be able to understand the, from the top of the design uh, business requirements all the way to, what devices did we actually work with the process development guys to to define and um, re- later realize? And that TI back then was making their own uh, silicon before their TSMC and UMC and all these uh, companies have been were actually TI was a customer for them for this. So uh, during TI's uh, journey, I, I actually sought several. You know, I you know I have the habit of seeking mentors. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if they're they're outside our our organization, so um, there was uh, uh, I saw the head of the analog business unit at TI. His name is Greg Lowe. Back then, he's, he's no he's he, he's in a different position now, CEO of WorldSpeed. But I asked for mentorship, and he was very generous and said, "Okay, let's do it again. Do you want to do this again?" I did it. But, but the analog business has a, a very interesting property: is that there are three or four people can actually design something. And then it becomes a product. And TI is providing the sales organization 
um, and then application, which includes application engineering, and then the entire engineering is three people. So wow. for a product line, that's not um, uh, for every product, but but th there are many products that are like this. Yeah. So that opened the door. Is like, okay, so why can't we do this um, uh, in an open way? I mean, when I say in an open way, meaning that enable people to design and provide the sales mechanism to connect and sell products or in this case custom uh, chips so that that exposure um at ti kind of opened you up to the full stack right like working working in analog chips allowed you to sort of see it sounds like sort of every aspect of both design and manufacturing yes indeed i, I left ti in the two thousand uh, 2011 mm -hmm. and um, um and I, it was a actually it was uh, yeah 2011 and then i um i started didn't start established right away um i knew that i needed some components that include especially the relationships with the foundries to be um uh, you know developed and make the case for them that this is a good business case that to work in such an open model and uh, I spent for that about two years in, and I was doing consulting for a project that makes, that enabled me to meet the foundry management for seven foundries. Oh, that's key. But it was a different, it just landed on me from, from another unprecedented, you know, I didn't know, you know, just complete uh, statistical probability, very low. So, and and then I started talk to the foundry managers uh, man, management, and then I started with the first foundry was XFab in Germany. Okay. So how did that evolve? What does eFabless do today, and how did that kind of evolve into that? So eFabless's go goal is is think about it as we want to to build. Um, we have a platform that enables somebody to take. 13 floors of a building and then add another or 15 and then other another five and then they're gone they're they're ready to go so the, the closest example of that is the app store there's a stack there's a standards there are quality metrics all that and then you add the apps now the apps a lot of them are not judged um, uh, or are not they don't have a financial return okay or they mm -hmm. don't even hear about it okay so that's called free market where somebody puts an app and it doesn't get a pull so we wanted to do that and with another with another aspect that doesn't exist in the app stores which is i can request something so i can come in and say okay i need a, something that does this a b and c and then on the other side there is a huge stadium of experts you know all over the world that actually can bid on it or take it and then um, solve the problem and uh, we provide everything in in between so, Mohammed, the the um, eFabulous platform allows a grad student or an entrepreneur or almost anybody uh, to access a PDK and the software to come in and design their own chip, right? You have something called, I think, a Caraval, which has the infrastructure uh, that gets them started, and then they can go in and start to to design everything uh, how they like. Is that right? Yes, yes. And then let me, I'd, I'd, I'd like to share a picture or, or just an assisting slide to make the point sure. around it. Because it makes a big difference. The example, the example here. This is Caravel, and I mentioned earlier that it um, you need to start if you start from the 15th floor to reach 20. So we provide a chip, and then the designer will focus on the piece of the chip that is not designed today, and mm -hmm. and they get a board. So if you think about this from multiple perspectives, one is uh, it reduces the time to design. So you have a you do, you focus on your IP, so you get it, and then on the other side you get a board. So literally, I have you know several boards here, but it's one of them here. So in the video, this is uh, um, the 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 version, the, the more recent version of the board that you see on the slide. Okay, so you get it, and that means you can plug into the USB, and it works right away. There's no um, there's no hassle with that. The that cycle makes it easy for anybody that deals with uh, raspberry pi or uh arduino like uh, systems they can actually do that yeah so the what eFabless added um is what 
you know, is to to create a full path with building pieces that we believe are housekeeping that anybody will do, but mm -hmm. you just want them to work. And um, the I call this uh, it's a instead of getting a lot on a house, you get uh, a framed house with electricity and plumbing, and you start moving in. The so I start out with my design. I get my software from eFabless. Yeah, you and mentioned the limitations. You 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 said yeah. that what are the limitations of that? So the the number one limitation, which is is a limitation for some designs for class of certain classes of designs, is the area. So yeah. the area here is ten millimeter squares. Uh, that said, you can fit a lot in ten millimeters square. Yeah, so the limitation here is the obviously the uh, the area uh, for a class of designs that surpasses this area. This is a one thirty nanometer process, so you have can put a lot. And mm -hmm. the second so called limitation from the perspective of the semiconductor progress view or a Moore's law view, this is a one thirty nanometer. So I I designed on this process uh, about twenty years ago. That was when it was in its inception, and. Yeah. Now there is, you know, they, we're we're pushing the three nanometer and with TSMC and others. The so some some designs require uh, faster or higher performance or lower power. So that's the we. If you have a strict power requirements, you'd have to do it in the design rather than the process. And so um, these are the current limitations, technical limitations. But uh, the the sky is the limit, and we have um, seen more than four hundred four hundred designs last year, coming from all over the uh, the globe, whether it's open source or not, um, yeah. and um, people are using it and and fitting it. That's a great trade off. Then, so you're sort of allowing just a much broader access, even though it's not the latest process node. You just get more people coming in with more designs, and it's trying, which cost trying helps. To the and the cost helps because this is so one you know this costs for for the for a customer ten thousand dollars so yeah. there's a test that I like one of my friends said so for a million dollars you can do a hundred designs yeah that's okay. right huh? typically uh, you'll say one design I need multiple millions <laughs> so yeah. today in the today's world and the more advanced and obviously the we're not going to have a, a, a phone processor done this way, but there are many applications, especially on the IoT, like edge devices. Well, so you mentioned, uh, you know, you ran 400 designs approximately last year. What's an example of a project or maybe a chip that was made that maybe wouldn't have been made if eFabless hadn't been there or is just particularly proud of? Well, the... Um, to the There is a major pull on the workforce development in, in the United States. And yeah. when we made that program available before we even announced it, we tested it with universities and started, people started ordering and said, when, how, how do I get it? And they uh, instated a new a course that, uh, that delivers uh, through the course that the uh, students would design something and deliver. The IEEE yeah. started a whole new program for uh, encouraging people to come to chip design, so they're using our platform for that. The in different places, and then you know, so it enables the, the if you know, on the there is that feature coolness. So mm -hmm. you find things like people have a built a sleep apnea device or uh, or a, a wakey wakey that was a design name that's basically a wake word that you know, listens to a wake word and it does something. So they're not necessarily products because they're majorly community. Uh, there are other startups that are doing this, and obviously we we don't know what their designs are unless they they oh, want yeah. to know. And but we're solving startups would come to us and say, "I wouldn't have been able to start this or think about it at all." Uh, yeah. Now, now I can actually do three in parallel and test different things, and you know, instead of actually having a very expensive one run. So quickly and inexpensively with just low overhead, just getting to market. You know, there's a great analogy here to Arduino, which I'm sure a lot of our 
users at least know a little bit about our, our sorry, our, our listeners know a little bit about. Um, I got my start with that micro sort of microcontroller design using Arduino. And when it first came out, it wasn't the fastest or it wasn't the best, but their view, their grand vision was, um, wasn't really cohesive. It was just get more tools into more people's hands and allow them to do what you know, and sort of enable them to execute on their vision. So similar story for 3D printing and wrap wrap. And, and this sounds like a new, you know, another great tool that's going to come out and enable a lot of people to to kind of implement their vision. So that's that's pretty cool. Have you have you accomplished the 14 year old uh, making the silicon yet? Um, so I'm I have a message on Twitter, direct message on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, saying to me, you need to change the number to nine. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, so I haven't done it yet, but uh, one of our uh, partners and, and actually one of the people that works with us on the, who has never designed a chip before announcing the program, he learned and he's created a, a company, a business around teaching people how to make their own chips. Typically in the semiconductor space, somebody who doesn't know chips wants to teach people who to make chips, that doesn't yeah. check out. Then, but if you actually think about it and how he does it, he basically creates a simple examples where people can, uh, um, uh, you know, have a few gates and put them together. And mm -hmm. it looks to them like a, just a, a little schematic. They don't even have to worry about how it's made. But at yeah. the end of the day, you're going to get a chip that they can test with a the board. They have that little design. So he aggregates 16, 16 pieces of designs in there. And, okay. and, um, and then, uh, have uh, uh, you know the, the, when the chip comes back, they every design is addressable. So the, the he created something called Tiny Tape. His name is Matt Venn, and and he created uh, Tiny Tape Out dot com, and that is literally a Tiny Tape Out. Then that's where a nine nine year old actually got in. Wow, that's great. Um, well, you you mentioned that. I mean, that's that's workforce development right there right there are hopefully future workforce but you kind of touched on workforce earlier but we're, we're about to onshore hopefully a lot of semi manufacturing back into the us mm -hmm. washington is just about ready to invest a hundred billion dollars into this industry um, a lot of that money is going into infrastructure new plants new facilities uh, what, what needs to happen in your view uh to human capital to sort of uh to, to to make sure that we can make the most of all that investment. So, and I, I I always separate the manufacturing from the, the the design. There are two different problems, and if you create manufacturing, which is, I think, it's it's great that the the, the government is doing this. Um, mm -hmm. I think, in my opinion, if the if the government subsidizes a program. There has to be a way to sustain it without continuous government money. So that's on the manufacturing side. On the design side uh, or workforce development, there are, you can split it into, uh, uh, you know, fab fabrication, manufacturing uh, talent and targeted to that and design talent. Yeah. Um, we have a problem here in the United States is that um, there's, there are not enough people that are interested in getting into this industry. So it's so you can some people call it the invisible industry because it's in everything, but but it's not really known that this is uh, doing the have an impact on every aspect of our life. And um, so raising awareness early and breaking the uh, the enigma that making your own chip is just impossible, uh, making it easy. One of the things that we're working on is that. To convert it completely to Python programming. So if you know Python, I can get you to um, to design a piece of a chip. Okay. So we're and and this is actually the, the part of the simplification. So it goes down. So there are programs on in robotics and so in the STEM programs. So mm -hmm. my goal is to get that. Not all of them, obviously, because not everyone needs a chip, but at least they know that they have that ability to do to create a chip a custom chip some people do it just be, be, they build a simple design because they want to go through the cycle and understand it so they can say i did it okay uh, and and then they can refine and come up with them so the there is a need for in raising the awareness in an effective way engaging way 
Um, and then um, there are programs coming out, like, for example, I've, I haven't seen that happen ever, actually, maybe years ago. But uh, there's a documentary coming out, uh, uh, sponsored or uh, uh, by Semi Foundation. That's, or, yeah. Yeah. And that documentary is about the industry and what what is where is it in our life? And it, it, uh, it's about a few a few uh, um, team members visiting the manufacturing facilities and understanding some of these impacts. Yeah, it looked really, uh, really compelling. Like, I think a few of them had rented a Winnebago and drove around to different facilities in the U.S. just interviewing yep. people up and down the whole stack and uh, what, what they were doing. Yeah, that's great. So it sort of exposes them and allows you know students that are um, yeah, and more and more importantly, it's the, the world. So they, they, are, they like basically you want that in the living rooms. Uh, yeah, and then the maximum, the best thing you can do is to have the children or the as early as students are as, as early as possible, see the options yeah. and then you can choose. If you don't show them the option, they will never choose it. That's or a good point. Choose it later. Later. So that's, that's what we th I think we should do. And uh, I do think that it needs to be in a, I, in a national, in a, we have so many universities and institutions um, in the community colleges, for example, mm -hmm. there, there is a lack of, in my opinion, th there is a need for a coherent national program rather mm -hmm. than um, sep you know, one, uh, you know, uh, like we say, we have, a, you know, $200 million for workforce development for the NSF. Um, that, well, are they going to be, how are they going to be distributed differently than before? So I, I'm watching for these things, and I think they have good people that are looking at these things. And what we need to make sure is that that we get down to uh, earlier in the in the schools. So well, you, one of the things you're, we you're, you're clearly not waiting for like a national strategy. I saw you're involved with Purdue's new semiconductor degree program um, yes. on the leadership board for that uh, for that program. And when I think about you know um, folks that are going into the industry today. Uh, come with specializations or maybe specific parts of the semiconductor design process or production, mm -hmm. maybe chemical engineering or material science or computer engineering, software development. Um, why do you think we need a degree specifically in semiconductors now? One of the very interesting things, it, it, the, the first time it was raised to me, um, I was working uh, with, with the Air Force on a program it was public. It was not classified or anything. It was a challenge. And then uh, I knew uh, several members of the teams there. And then one of them said, we have a problem, Houston. So what is it? And said, uh, we don't have enough uh, you know, U.S. citizens that are um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this industry. So yeah. we, have a, we have a depletion of that. When you're talking to the Air Force, they need American citizens that they need sort of twofold they need somebody with the engineering degree but also someone who's an american citizen that can have a clearance at the appropriate level to work on whatever sort of Correct. technology and right. uh, and the and that is actually um you know it you can call it a national security problem eventually okay especially with the direction that the the, the geopolitics is just re reshaping and doing going in a different in a direction where you know compartmentalization more than yeah. globalization um, so that said, there there is another uh, interesting uh, statistic that came from the NSF years ago. Uh, it says that in the graduate schools in the United States, the uh, the top ten where when they looked at the grad the where the undergraduate degrees were coming from. So mm -hmm. so you know so United States graduate schools looking at where did the students come from for these degrees, for the graduate degrees. The NSF had that um, said, basically, the top 10 universities, uh, two in China, two in Iran, one in Pakistan. And so the top 10, they don't include a U.S. university. The first university is Georgia Tech, number 23. Really? So that is actually a, 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 a stunning statistic to show that and it, it, it's not a problem necessarily with the schools or it, it shows that there aren't people interested in advanced degrees in that area. Um, 
and some people talked about immigration reform so mm -hmm. to, to address that so there are many aspects uh, around the around the uh, getting the workforce development addressed so it's really interesting yeah I, I always view like one of america's sort of um uh advantages so that if you assume that talent is dispersed globally kind of evenly right anybody can be born with, with like talent or creativity then um anybody can grow up and if the system works anybody can grow up and become an american right mm -hmm. and so that's a, that's an advantage as long as we can continue to attract those people um here to come do those things that you know that'll always be an advantage but the one thing i say here because so um it, we get uh, contacted by programs in different countries europe uh, the middle mm -hmm. east for workforce development they the they have problems in getting their, the talent to supply their current operations or design centers yeah and they take from each other and so if it's if you're a big company that's wouldn't you know and you know create or kneecap you but if you're a 20 person company and you get you lose five for another company uh you're, yeah. you're getting it so um so it, it is a it is a problem and it is actually here we have a similar you know problem and uh, we need to increase the pool that we're starting with so that the when it, when it shrinks to the graduate schools <laughs> we have enough more than zero yeah so, so those those uh countries you talked about um it, outside the U.S. are approaching, do they have um, national level sort of strategies set up and they're approaching you of like, so kind of way to say, let's do this, you know, for thousands of students. So absolutely. So um, uh, it would be beyond belief that, that I, I, I would, I would actually, because I was um, get contacted by different programs. So um, I, as, as I said, I grew up in Egypt. So I'm a member of a committee that uh, that basically wrote uh, the, the again stars aligned we're not um, uh, we were through the good work of a village right um, we ended up with the president of Egypt asking some one of us not me but but somebody on the ground in Egypt tell me what do you need to so, to make your we you have thirty companies in semiconductor space I, how do you double that so yeah. we we got a white paper uh, written for for the president it got approved line by line yeah and but budget and everything uh this is where it's interesting because that was an an executive order okay versus the and there's a training program of twelve thousand people five of them are semiconductor uh, semiconductor focused and uh, seven thousand are uh, embedded development in automotive and security uh and this is the founding program it's going to be national and it's about to start yeah that's an effective scale 12,000 students at a time right that yes and that is uh, and and it's and it, it if you think about that number and you scale it to the US needs um it's as it, I don't think we're spending enough to be honest with you like the numbers we were talking about ten thousand dollars per student out of the twelve thousand, yeah. okay. If yeah. you do that here, you 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 will surpass any budget that you've heard of about workforce development. Um, so you can see almost you know in almost every aspect of the Chips Act, workforce is kind of tied in or sewn, and it's called out in the law in a couple different places. And I think the reflex when we're sort of talking about workforce development is to sort of look over at academia and of course look for the funding from government and talk about curriculum and stem programs um what do you what do you think the industry can do better to sort of make this work so the industry i mean it's actually very difficult to actually talk about it in an okay i'm going to try to be objective here the industry is the ultimate no naming names right <laughs> the ultimate the ultimate consumer of yeah the talent right and they if you go to companies you will find they have a university program they have a dedicated maybe a team interfacing with universities the goal there was to is to get injected products or their 
to the students in a, in, to, so they can learn. Recently in the Purdue uh, uh, first uh, board meeting uh, for the semiconductor degrees uh, uh, board, the, there is a request for actual course content to be developed by the industry. Hmm. So, so, and that, that is actually unique. When you get a, a course, the industry knows exactly what you want. And you you shape content and material that with the, not just one course it would be several skill sets, and mm -hmm. they would. This is something that I I haven't seen at a scale. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, there are other ways of doing that. Like the industry would work with a university to fund a specific project, so to that fee, that is useful for their business. Um, there is something that the SRC. There's there are many avenues. The mm -hmm. what I what I what I don't see is that uh, the some sort of a, a, a deliberate effort to to to, to 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 have a baseline that is very high that is high versus yeah. I'm I I I'm, I'm, I have a simple statistic and I just I, if you have a thousand universities in the United States okay more you have more um, yeah. how many of them are actually coupled to the industry. I don't have a number, but uh, I'm guessing less than uh, 25%, less than 25% that has connections to universities. Um, uh, don't quote me on that. I just made up that number based on, because sure. based on what I see. So I see major universities have uh, uh, a lot of good partnerships with the industry. And yeah. then there are some universities that have the degrees and they're great talent suppliers or talent, they have great programs. But they're yeah. not they're not supported properly with the industry. Um, so starting there is is not a bad idea to make these universities have more resources, and the lift the lift will be high if you do it, and across you know universities that are not that are underserved. Maybe that's the advantage of the Purdue program that focuses just on semiconductors. That just yes. makes it. Easy for industry to make those direct connections for hiring pipelines and curriculum and and building the workforce that they really need. So. Yeah, and and then there are many, multiple ways, like I you know, to engage them. So one of the things is that absolutely uh, when the university I went to, the University of Waterloo, enforces mm -hmm. that one of your the three quarter three uh, quarter three uh, uh, terms in the in the in the in the school in the calendar year. One of them has to be an internship or a co-op. Okay. By the okay. time you're graduated, you have four of these in the in your four in four four months internships, or um, and it's a requirement. So, mm -hmm. and there is a fair the companies would come in, and so increasing that is 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 very important because it starts to naturally measure the what the students would know. Uh, with the real industry. The other thing that I've seen very useful, and I, I'm sure that it exists outside Purdue, but the, there is a, Purdue has a program, it's called the Vertical Integration Program, where they have a team that's constructed from, of students vertically. So from freshmen all the way to uh, senior or graduate school, and you have that team working on a project and the courses sort of solving a real you know, a problem. And the courses that they take, they, there's a baseline of courses that you have to take, and the, the, they take the courses that support this project. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting because you get the freshman to work with the uh, senior student or a graduate school student. Yeah. And then, so there, you can slice it and dice it, in there, but I, 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 I see these are uh, as, as great programs that can be um, scaled. Like yeah. the first thing they, they asked me, you know, one of the things that inputs that I give to the board is, is like, why didn't you make that, uh, you know, 50x or, uh, you know, instead of, you know, X number of students multiplied by, you know, 50. And see, yeah, how do you get it going kind of at the national scale, right? Yeah. Like, um, yeah. just, just needs to go. Well, I uh, wanted to also ask, I know coming back to eFabulous, you all uh, just announced a partnership, Google, Skywater, Global Foundries. I think you just uh, signed a partnership with Skywater and Google. Um, that's really big news. Those are some big partners to to join up with. What's um what's the plan there? Well, so it it 
it started uh, through again um, interesting sequence of events that um, uh, you know Skywater uh, saw the benefit of having an open source uh, PDK, which is the representation of their process. It's not the actual technology; it's a, it's the models that you need to use to build the design. So the theory was very simple, or the premise is very simple. Uh, if I make it available to thousands of people, the chances of hitting designs and getting customers is going to be higher. Yeah. So um, Google, we we arranged that partnership we, we, and Google got in, engaged and obviously for the brand and the funding. And this, uh, since this uh, uh, partnership started, um, Google has been funding um, every four, uh, let's say four uh, shuttles a year on Skywater processes. Uh, okay. And, uh, and uh, the, so we're four last year. And the, today, uh, this year is four. We just announced the last one. Um, eFabulous is is doing all the enge- all the engineering work required to make these programs work. So whether it's getting the the tools, uh, 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 basically uh, organized in a flow that somebody can use it easily, or mm-hmm. the shuttle management, or the um, uh, the develop chip, the developing the chip Caravel. So this has been great. And actually, it led into two things. So in order to make that a, a, a bigger program, we always thought that we need to include other foundries. And so we showed the results of the number of designs, explosion and number of designs on Sky 130 to yeah. several foundries, including Global Foundries Management. And to their credit, they looked at it and they understood that there's a potential here. It helped that there were data available on uh, Sky 130. And also we got Google involved in that case as well. And that helped. So now Global Foundries as well uh, launched a program with eFabulous and Google to, uh, to run a 180 nanometer process. And um, so it is, <clears throat> It, it's getting bigger and expensive. Mm-hmm. The, uh, we had we are uh, doing something new, so we're we're doing you know there there were some hiccups in the in the getting things on time and things like that, but it's moving in the right direction, and uh, and uh, there's more coming. I just can't speak of it, but but it's it, 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 that that dynamic that was created by uh, to 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 Google and Foundries. It start it's just avalanching, and uh, it will be more. It'll be a big change in the industry. Great. So just getting started. Yes. Um, fantastic. And I don't know if you saw this, but there is. Uh, we made a uh, the same pitch to the Navy Crane uh, mm-hmm. uh, team, um, and they 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 got excited, very excited about the premise of having an open source process. And in July, uh, it, there was a DOD announcement that Skywater will uh, open source the 90 nanometer PDK. Um, in, and that is, again, so we're going to be doing the engineering work for that. But this is the United States government actually endorsing that program, and uh, which is, you know, something that, you know, a lot of good validation and also um, it gives a, a more teeth to the program as you go forward and lower, uh, lower, um, smaller nodes. That's great. Wow. Yeah. The big partners like that, it sounds like just gonna, like you said, just start snowballing and, and keep going. That's fantastic. Mohammed, you and me fab us well on your way. You know, you have a message for other innovators that are out there trying to do something big in the semiconductor market or in the semiconductor innovation space. What's that message? So the first message uh, in the semiconductor space is that it is not the same. Don't look at the semiconductor industry as the way it was two years or three years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, the with that partnership, the partnership with Google, Global Foundry, Skywater, um, Nefabless, uh, we all as a, as a village takes a village as I always say um, created a new trend, a new um, um, structure of the economics that will make it much easier to to get into, to to to, to, in, to make you think about a custom chip. Now, not everything requires a custom chip, but so if you come to eFabless, 
uh, and you try uh, something just to know that it's possible and it's a tool in your hand to exercise it when needed versus it's a brick wall i don't know how to get there and it's something for the big companies to do so yeah it, so there you can have um, a prototype chip or a minimum or a low volume chip under um, ten thousand dollars for 300 parts and then you can go from there all the way to you know thousands of units uh within you can have twenty twenty thousand dollars you get a thousand units so so now if you think about that uh, the other economic the, the the traditional economic structure for that it wouldn't have been possible um so assume think about that now on the other in the semiconductor space the always solve a real problem because it, 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 that's actually wins and uh, and i i see it, when you start thinking about some something to solve like this mm-hmm. something like the 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 airpods yeah. it wouldn't be possible to do it this way unless you think that you're going to have a custom chip otherwise you'd have to live with the form factor of what you get yeah so you, it gives you better design for example yeah yeah so solving real problems and um and that means in your agriculture, medicine, health, and, um, education, all of that. So solve a real problem. Just get off the couch and do it because eFabless has lowered the cost and lowered the technical barriers and lowered the time to to bring it to market or to, right. to get get the prototype turned right. And, and there are there is yeah, and there is a huge number of examples that can be just available on our website from people trying things, new things that wouldn't have been possible before yeah well Mohammed, thanks for taking the time to share so much today about eFabless um and the great work you're doing and we hope to have you back again soon well thank you very much for having me and uh, uh, looking forward to talking again